Thank you very much for and thank you for inviting me here. Um, I would say that I feel a bit out of place. Uh, we saw two equations up until now. So maybe I'll have a little bit more. Um, so I'm going to talk about brain intelligence DCS. I'm going to describe the phenomena, then we're going to derive an alpha model and Hopefully, we'll have time to analyze it a little bit. So, you all know what CIC is, but what are bright intelligence? Well, um, anything before I said I'm going to zoom up, so I'm going to zoom in. So, when we study CIC, we drill out these high scores, and if we zoom in, we can see inside these liquid bridges inside our scores, and these liquid. These liquid regions are high speed whistling. So, what happens during the freezing process? During the freezing process, the seawater starts to freeze, but actually, what turns into ice is just the water. So, the salt doesn't go into the solid matrix. Um, the salt is rejected from the solid ice, it is captured by the solid ice, and then it stays inside. And it stayed liquid. Okay, so one thing that is important to um, understand is that is, there is no soil inside the solid ice. Uh, these bright inclusions on the millimeter scales are laced through the ice, like you see here. But as the temperatures go up, so we have the rule of five, the rule of five sucks, and either the temperature goes above minus five degrees Celsius, or there is more than 5% brine volume fraction, or the solidity is about five, is above 550. Then these brine inclusions starts to connect. They connect to form meter long channels through which fluid can flow. And this fluid flow is very important for the transport of nutrient carbon and salts within the, uh, the ice. Okay. Um, another thing, this brine intrusion can impact the amino. So, um, hopefully, you know what the video is. A video is the amount of reflected light from a surface, and not all surfaces are the same. So, ocean observe most of it. If we have ice and snow, then it will reflect most of it. Um, and definitely, when we think of sea ice, we want to know what's the distribution of these brine inclusions inside to see if we can say something more about the amino. These brine inclusions and brine channels are also an important part of our ecosystem. So if we look at an ice core, uh, which has algae in it, the bottom 10 centimeters of it, um, it's actually habitat for algae and microorganisms. How do we categorize CIS? So we drill it out, and then it's categorized by the uh, depth and temperatures at which it was harvested. And usually what measured is the temperature, the salinity, and the brine volume fraction. <laughs> and that's a lot to take in. So let's focus on the temperature. The temperature, Oh, sorry, before then. So these are measurements from uh, 2012, um, 2012, and it goes, the blue is September, the orange is November, beginning of November, and the red is the end of, the, of November. So we're going into summer. And what do we see? Well, we see that the temperature is a function of death. But more importantly, looking at the temperature, we see that they Gradient temperature is seems to be spatially constant throughout the sample. The other information that we have, well, we have the salinity, which is the bulk salinity, that's the salinity within the, uh, the solid ice and the brine inclusion. And we have the brine volume fraction. So using these two, basically saying there is no salt inside the ice. I can take my salinity and divide it by the brine volume fraction, and then I we can get the brine, the brine salinity, the salinity within the brine, yeah? as a function of that. 
So that's what they did. It seems nicer because it's linear. It just doesn't give me enough information. So I'm going to do one more step and I'm going to say, I'm actually interested in looking at the bright salinity as a function of temperature. And that's what we have here. So here we get a nice linear function and we need to think why? And basically we need to remember the microscopic effect, right? So when we take water and we add some salt to it, then we reduce the freezing temperature. And that's exactly what we see here. So the cryoscopic effect for small deviation in temperature and for um, low salinities is actually a linear function. That's the dashed line that you see here. And you can see how nicely this um, the salinity inside the pores um, sits inside and on this side. <clears throat> okay. We are motivated, of course, by experiments. So this is an experiment done by Light and her group. Um, what they did, they took a, an ice sample at minus 30 degrees Celsius with four big bright inclusions inside. And then they wanted to look at the cooling and heating cycle. So they first heat it up and then they cool it back down. Right, and uh, you can see that as they heat it up, the brine intrusion increase at minus four degrees. They already connect on this tube, and then freezing it back to minus 13 degrees. This tube contract, however, it does not break, it does not go back to these three intrusions. The question is, why? Wouldn't you expect it to know? Well, we're not sure. It is possible that if the freezing would have been done using a temperature gradient, then they could have recovered the three initial running switches. Okay, <clears throat> so what did we do? And I'm showing you my results. I'm kind of showing you the end of the book, right? But these are the results. So this is a paper um, just been accepted by SNCF. And we can do the same. So we can get a brine inclusion with very high salinity inside and freeze it. So we reduce the temperature from minus two to minus six, no temperature gradient. And then our tube behaves exactly like the experiment. Now, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. These are real experiments done in the real lab with real prison equipment. This is real math done with a real pencil and ink. <laughs> so um, we're just yet saying our model can show that if you freeze a tube with high salinity, it will contract, it will not feature. However, we just saw that there's very high temperature gradient and very constant during the freezing system. So, what happens to our model? If we take temperature gradient and then we reduce the temperature from minus 4 to minus 70. <clears throat> so, um, in this case, we started with the same tube, just as we did before, high salinity in the middle, and then very quickly it pinched off relatively in the middle. And our analysis stopped there for many, many reasons, mathematical reasons. But what it shows us that we would expect the tube to break into equal sizes bits, equal sizes inclusions. And this temperature and temperature gradient are actually corresponding to about um, 20 centimeter depth. What if I take something else? Well, let's look at about one meter depth. And then in this case, so my temperatures are a bit warmer, so I'm going from minus 2 to minus 10. And it doesn't pitch in the middle anymore. It looks like it's going to pitch up at, at the top. And if I go down into um, even warmer temperatures, then I'm actually moving the pitch of point, the expected pitch of point to the top. <clears throat> okay. So that's what we want to show. Now we want to derive a mathematical model to do that. 
So um, what do I want to do? So let's make sure that we know that. So I, I basically want to take a piece of ice. A piece of ice with one gram inclusion in it and see what happens to it. Okay, so I'm going to have three parameters and I'm going to use the phase parameter, which will tell me if it's liquid or um, solid, zero for solid, one for liquid, and it's continuous. We'll have the temperature and we'll have the salt. These are my three parameters. And in 1990, <clears throat> 2005 introduced um, several models to describe the entropy of temperature-dependent phase change. So we're going to use the simplest model, <laughs> because even the simplest one is already more. Um, in the simplest model, they basically say that the entropy density is the integral, um, I'm sorry, that the entropy of the system is a spatial integral of the entropy density, and the entropy density takes this form. And what is this form? Well, let's start with this one. We have a potential, that's a double wave potential <clears throat> um, in the system. We have this graph feature, so P is our phase parameter, water or um, ice, liquid or, or solid, and this term actually penalizes surface area, okay, because we're looking at the entropy, and now we want to incorporate solid into this system. So we're going to change this term here, so that we introduce solid. So this is our modified entropy, and the first term, that's the thermal entropy. It's a very standard term in some sense. The last two terms, well, I semi introduced them to you. So this term, in a light surface area. And the last term, well, it was a double wave potential, uh, equal depth potential. And now it's going to be a tilted double wave potential, it's not equal depth anymore, and it's going to depend upon Xi. So Xi is our cryoscopic term. So I'm going to include the cryoscopic effect into the system, and basically it says if, if the cryoscopic effect is um, negative, then I'm going to prefer ice, and if it's positive, I'm going to prefer liquid. Um, this part, scaling parameter H, is a big parameter and it's the ratio of inclusion length to interface. And I introduced almost everything except for this one because that's the nice one. So, this first term that's the salt entropy relative to liquid water density. Okay, basically, what happens is that the salt ions, the water, solvent. The salt ions. And during the freezing process, unfavorably, we're decreasing the entropy. So, um, when you think of the water and the salt ions, they are basically magnetizing, and we need to rip them apart, we need to put work into separating them. And so, that's what happens. We're, we're pushing them away, we get these regions with high salinity, and then because of the cryoscopic effect, they don't freeze. That's why we get these uh, liquid regions that are still liquid. Okay. So we have our entropy, and this is our entropy density. And now what do we want to do? Well, we want our model to <clears throat> conserve internal energy, increase the entropy, and to um, conserve salt. So it's good. Because what are our parameters? Uh, we had so, so I just need to conserve that. We had the phase parameter. We'll deal with that in a second. And then we have temperature. Temperature is a nice parameter. It's just problematic to work with. The main, the main reason that we didn't use temperature is because temperature satisfies this fundamental thermodynamic relation. It says that the change in the internal energy with respect to the energy is the temperature. 
but it's not a quantity I can conserve. So I'm going to change variables. I'm going to move from my phase parameter temperature and so on to phase parameter internal energy and so on, because that's what I want to conserve. And I'm going to do that too, sorry, using the thermodynamical framework. So I have S, again, S is our entropy density. Um, we can connect S to this. We have an inter parameter. We can connect it to psi, we don't really need psi, but we need psi so we can get U. U is an internal energy. Okay. And we do that, <clears throat> we can express U in this term, in this way. And um, what's nice about this way, I, I don't want you to bring the equations in you know, in these letters. I want you to look at the formulation of that. So the first term here is basically an antiderivative of the cryoscopic term. And the last two terms, we've seen them before, these are the thermal entries. So that's our internal energy. We can express, a, we can eliminate theta by saying that now everything is actually a function of the internal energy, redefine our, um, our system, and now what we want. So now we have everything in terms of the phase parameter, the, the, the internal energy, and the so on. And now we want the flow that is determined by the gradient of S. Okay? And what do I mean by we want a flow determined by the gradient of S? Well, we have the phase parameter, which I said we get back to it, so let's talk about it now. We use the phase parameter to create a, a dissipation mechanism, basically because the system conserves internal energy or we want it to conserve internal energy and salt. However, we do not conserve water and liquid by themselves. So we can use the phase parameter to get the gradient flow. <clears throat> we have two conservation laws for, to make sure that we conserve the internal energy and the salt. And uh, subject to zero flow boundary conditions, um, our entropy increases. So we have what we want. <clears throat> and if that wasn't complicated enough, now I actually have the letters. And I don't want you to go equation by equation, but I can tell you that choosing a reasonable, correct, or reasonable <laughs> uh, mobilities, um, I think we can get a coupled system for the phase parameter. The, the internal energy and the salt. And what I want you to focus on here is basically the third equation. That's N. N is my salt. Okay? And I want you to look at this equation because the salt is the interesting part of the system. And what do I mean by that? Well, what happens? So we have the ice. And again, a drop of ice, one ice, one prime inclusion inside with high salinity, and then I'm freezing it. So I'm basically pushing the salt inside. So I'm pushing the salt into a region with high salinity. So I'm pushing the salt up its concentration gradient. That's exactly the definition of a chemotaxis process. Okay? So uh, we have this salt. That is going up its uh, concentration gradient. And in the 70s, Keller and Segal introduced a model to describe chemotaxis processes. And it's very similar <clears throat> to ours. Um, what, what they have in their model is U, which is um, some scalar, and V is a uh, chemical attractor. And it's very similar to ours, especially here. So there, this function is called the sensitivity function in their model, and we have it here. And the, the two um, red ones are this uh, function that couples, in our case, the phase parameter and the 
Why am I bringing up um, Hermotex's process? Well, this model of um, how Sega and Teller uh, was very, very popular. It became very, very popular basically because it was relatively tractable and they, and they captured nice patterns in it. So they could see traveling planes and they could see um, peaks inside the population that expands and um, everyone started using it. It has its downside, so there is no global existence of solution. More importantly, there is no maximum principle, which basically means that we have to work much, much harder to achieve everything um, that we want with the system. Now, to make our systems even a bit more challenging than we have this feed, we also have a similarity because on the eyes, the place parameter is zero. So we have to be a little bit careful. Okay, so we have our model. Let's see what I can say on this model. So after changing parameters, Remember, we started the phase parameter, temperature, and um, so. But then we said temperature, well, temperature, let's go to the internal energy. Oh, well, let's go back to the temperature. I like to work with the temperature in my model. So we want to, to introduce new coordinates. We basically want to go back to the temperature. We rewrite and so as a function of C, the phase parameter and rho, where we take rho to be the salt density relative to liquid water density. Now, I'm not changing my system at this point, I'm just recasting it. And doing it in this way just allows me to write my potential um, as a equal to that W potential as in water, plus cooperation. Okay, and why is that less well? But then I get a couple of systems for the phase parameter, the temperature, and the salt, which is what I wanted at the beginning. And that's the simplest form that we could come up with. Okay. So, what do we do next? So, <clears throat> we're um, basically using the classical um, sharp interface scaling. The multi-scale analysis shows that we get a Stefan type problem. Okay. Whoever is to face um, phase change, you've probably heard about Stefan type problems before. Um, what do we get? We have the um, temperature, and the temperature is <clears throat> continuous throughout the domain. The temperature doesn't care if it's ice or liquid, which makes sense. But we do have a jump in the ice, right? We have zero ice on the, um, I'm sorry, we do have a jump in the soil. We have zero soil in the ice, and we have very high salinity inside. Okay, so we have uh, a jump over the interface, which means that we need to introduce a new boundary condition, a new interface boundary conditions which means that we need to impose a local soil concentration and then we're getting this uh, sweeping interface of boundary condition and we call it sweeping but basically that's what happens the ice comes in and it just sweeps all the soil inside okay our boundary conditions is coupled to um, the normal velocity which we obtain through um, Flex calculations, flex calculations, and the normal velocity is um, coupled to the curvature that's half and not, and the cryostopic term and the <clears throat> so basically what we get is curvature driven flow mediated by the cryostopic term. Now on the first flex scale, the temperature and the soil will equilibrate, equilibrate very fast, but the interface evolves on a slow time scale, very, very slow time scale, which means that my system will get to equilibrium 
only after, even though the temperature and the salt are already done with moving, only after my interface will start moving, only once this normal velocity will be zero. Hmm. Okay. So, as I said, on the first time scale, the temperature is basically a linear function of depth. Um, we have the salt, which equilibrates to a constant. And then we have this uh, normal velocity. And when I say fast and slow, then fast means um, about two weeks. And slow means that it will take a full winter season for the um, shade to get its way. So what can I do? Well, the first thing that the easiest I showed you tubes. I showed you tubes before, and the reason I showed you tubes is because saying, oh, I need ground to present. Okay, but if we want to actually see, we need to think of some geometry, right? So in this case, we can think of a reduction to axisymmetric surface. Uh, surface resolution. Basically, you think about the core that is over the field. And I will make it. So, um, given this nice excess symmetric uh, surface resolution, I can express the curvature as the as in terms of R. And R is the distance from the center. Okay? Um, I'm saying, okay, I have no question. <laughs> so, um, I can express K0, I can plug it back in, and what I get, again, remember, the salt has already rolled, went to equilibrium, same as the temperature, so all I have here is a second order um, OD, and I don't know, if there's anything that you need to know about math, is that we always want to get an OD, we know how to solve it. <laughs> so, we can solve the OD. We can look at what happens and equilibrium. Okay, so that's what I'm taking. Um, I need some initial conditions, so I'm going to have some width where I start with, and I'm going to change the. Um, I am going to fix the thermal gradient. Now this system doesn't move in this case, so I showed the pictures before how the tubes. Um, seems to pinch off, but this one I'm just looking at what happens at equilibrium. So if I take a very, very a small temperature gradient, then I get the dashed line, which is a little bit paper. If I increase the thermal gradient, then it starts to oscillate with faster tapering. But then if I take a really nice um, gradient, a temperature gradient, then it will pinch up. Okay. Now, dynamically speaking, <clears throat> from a mathematical point of view, these equations are most likely unstable. So there is no reason for us to think that something would end up looking like that. What it does give us is the um, understanding of how critical the temperature gradient during this freezing process is to the shape of the um, tube or to the shape of the brand of the tube. Um, so we do expect to see multiple uh, pitch of points. And just uh, one more thing is that I say high temperature gradient and low, and I um, you can ask me which one is relevant. So for definitely for the uh, for the but the southern hemisphere, the, there is a very, very high temperature gradient during the winter. So it goes to about, about 15 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, <clears throat> so when we do it, first, most of you are still up, <laughs> and I'm very happy to that. Uh, what I presented is a thermodynamically consistent model. Uh, to describe the evolution of brine inclusions in CS. <clears throat> I emphasize, hopefully, that you all leave this room saying, oh, when we're freezing the ice and we want to see what happens, we're going to freeze it with temperature gradient. What do I mean by 
that much of what it doesn't think the same, right? If I do the entire thing, just by putting the entire sea ice in a freezer with minus 13, that's uniform. If I freeze it from the top with fixed temperature at the bottom, that would be the temperature gradient. So I need to live with this understanding, then I will feel like I did what I came here to do. We showed that for um, at the top of the sea ice, well, we have very low temperature, but again, high temperature gradient. Then we expect to get similar sizes of inclusions, um, while at the bottom of the um, of the sea ice, closer to the water interface, we expect to see chains of small inclusions with a few big ones at the bottom. And. Thanks, Noah.